apologize for getting things a little confused there. I think I introduced the idea of uh, issue queue detaching the, the front end of the processor. So we call the fetch and decode logic the processor front end. The middle is really kind of the core, the execution core. The right back part of it is the back end. And then we walk through an example with an issue queue, uh, the unscheduled naively generated code with a register renaming and an issue queue. And we showed that, well, you actually have to have a larger issue queue in order to avoid stalling the front end when the issue queue fills up and you still have opportunities to let instructions into the pipeline. And um, the other notable thing about the issue queue is that essentially it, it replaces the scoreboard since we've got that valid bit and all the dispatched and pending bits. So it replaces the scoreboard and also the instruction lives in the issue queue as long as it's in flight. So we use this issue queue to keep track of what's in the processor. So that's, that's about where we ended up. And with this issue queue, we have a new notation, which is lowercase i to indicate that an instruction is waiting in the issue queue. So it's pending, it's waiting for some of its operands to be ready. Well, instructions later in the program are allowed to go before it. And this is how we get out of order execution. With an advanced scoreboard, you can actually know that a load word is going to generate the value $1 needed by this store word $1. And you can actually track when this instruction that's going to produce $1 got dispatched to its functional unit and count down how long until it's going to be ready. The way you do this is with um, a, a shift register that shifts one bit every single cycle. So you set the shift register to the length of the pipeline. So you have a two-stage memory pipeline. Your shift register has one and a zero, so it's two stages. And each cycle you shift by one bit when the value of that one bit reaches the least significant bit, you know that on the next cycle, it's gonna be ready. That's kind of a sketch of the idea. If you didn't get it, don't worry about it too much. Like the details, not super important. Just the fact that you can do that and that's how you do it. You can predict when $1 is going to be written before it's actually ready. And so then you know, okay, when I'm in cycle five, I can know that the value of dollar one is going to be ready in one more cycle, which allows me to start to dispatch this store word because I know I can forward the value coming out of this M2 into my M1. That's the idea. So I know it's ready before it's ready so I can get things started anticipating that the value I need will be available when I need it. When you do that, you can shave one cycle off of some of these dependencies and therefore can improve processor performance by reducing the number of cycles per instruction on average. A bigger problem is hazards through memory. If your, your address of zero of $1.29 is the same, it's not in this case, but if it were the same here, we would have reading after writing and we'd have to be able, we'd have to be careful to preserve that. And I'll have an example, I think, of that at some point. So one thing that processors have to do when they have out of order execution is they have to first make sure what are the effective addresses of the loads and stores before it can consider allowing loads and stores to be scheduled across one another. We don't have that yet but right there. Memory disambiguation, general term for figuring out what actual memory addresses are being accessed. So here we have a little snippet of code. It's not the same code. It's a little bit different in order to create this problem that we're gonna see in just a moment. First two instructions here, they'll get fetched, decode, and at the end of decode, they'll go into the issue. So here, we're in cycle one, but it's really cycle three because we're we've issued these things, right? So this second group of store word and load word, presumably they're inside of the decode waiting uh, on the next cycle to get written into the issue queue. We're dealing with a, a one stage execute pipeline and a two stage memory pipeline. So we've got 
two valid instructions in the issue queue. They have not been dispatched. One is a load, one is an add. The immediate for the load is zero. The immediate for the add is negative four. The first source register is not pending. It's available from the ARF. It's, it's R29 for the load and for the add, it's R29 as well. They don't have a source two register. Their destinations are waiting to be written and they haven't been renamed. That's the issue key. So either so far so good or hoping that if you rewatch it enough times, it'll come clear. I get that. On the next cycle, when these next two instructions finish decode, they'll get written into the uh, issue queue and we'll be able to dispatch the first two instructions because they're ready. We dispatch or issue the first two instructions with non-pending read operands. They get their values directly from the register file R29. We populate the next two entries in the issue queue with the next two instructions coming out of the front end. So we got the store word here. It's immediate is zero. It is waiting to read from the rename register file one. So R29 has a valid remap entry. Its index is one. So that means rename register file entry one is now the new name for R29. We want to read from rename register file entry one for R29. The other source operand is the dollar one, which is coming out of this load word. And it also has been renamed. Remap table entry for register one is index zero. So rename register file zero is the name of dollar one now. Store words don't update any registers, so there's no destination to write. The last load word here has an immediate of negative four. It has a read operand of register 30, and it's ready. It's not pending. It's going to write to R2. So this is the issue queue, and these are the instructions we're going to focus on. Let's see why there's a problem. At this point, we dispatch or issue this uh, load word out of order because it has no pending operands it's waiting for. So it's good to go. Issue or dispatch the load word out of order because it's ready. And the add I completes and it writes the rename register file, the old value of R29, minus four. And we free the, the name, that's fine. At any rate, here the add I completes. It updates the register file, rename register one. And the store word picks up that value, but it's not going to be ready to go yet because it's still waiting for the load to finish. Now when the load finishes, that means that the value at the memory address 4096 has been loaded into $1 and also into the rename register file. We might update the rename register file. We would update R1 as well here. Since the destination is 1, we would write the value being produced to the ARF as well. So at this point, the store word here is no longer pending, so it's going to be able to issue. So we can issue the store word. The load word is in the second stage of its memory pipeline, so it's almost done. So in the next cycle, we're going to be in the first stage of the memory pipeline for this store word, and this load word is finishing. And what happens is that the load word loads into $2 the value at memory address negative 4 offset from 30, well, that's 4,092, but the memory of 4,092 is actually supposed to be whatever gets stored by this store word because that's what zero offset from $29 is. The modification of 29 by negative 4 and then storing to zero offset from 29 made this store word have the same value as negative 4 offset from $30 because originally 29 and 30 had the same value in them. So $29 minus 4 is equal to $30 minus 4. So that load word completes. It updates the rename register file in the ARF with the wrong value of whatever is in the memory address 4092 that it loaded from it uh, one or two cycles before this store word um, stores to it. This is a, a raw hazard through memory. Right, we've got the true dependency here of the store word of dollar one to this address, and then load word from the same address. So the true dependency is through the addresses accessing the same location, and we have to preserve that read after write, that true dependency. We didn't, so we end up with the wrong value 
in the ARF. That is the example here. Drain out the example now. The store word finishes and it writes memory R2 is not consistent with what is really supposed to have been read from memory. The general approach to solving the memory disambiguation problem is to split memory operations or memory pipelines. So the first step is called address generation. This is usually done with something called an address generation unit, which is just calculating the effective address. Then you can use those to detect equivalent addresses. We need a, another structure where we're going to store pending memory accesses until we can resolve their addresses and be sure that they can go to the memory. So we replace the buffer between the two stages, M1 and M2, with a structure known generally as a load store queue. It's going to hold the loads and stores in program order. We allocate the load store queue entries from the issue queue in program order, which the issue queue preserves program order as well. This way we can serialize the loads and stores um, with respect to each other so we know what order they're supposed to go in. This allows us to generate addresses out of order and still do the data memory accesses in order when the addresses are dependent on each other. Whenever we know the earlier effective addresses, then we can dispatch from the load store queue out of order when the earlier addresses do not match. Even if their data is not ready, we can dispatch them out of order. And there'll be an example here in a moment. This is memory disambiguation. Here's our same little snippet of an example. Up here, we have our issue queue. Down here, we have our load store queue now. Um, and we still got our, our register renaming support here. When we populate an issue slot, in the issue queue with a memory uh, operation. We also allocate a slot in the load store queue. Basically, we can think of this as happening at the end of decode. The load store queue stores the address, the value for um, store instructions, and the issue queue slot number. So this is a, a tag, or in, in this case, maybe an index with its issue uh, slot. These are valid or ready bits again. The address is not ready. The value for load, this doesn't matter. When we dispatch this load word, right now it's going to be, well, actually being issued, going through the issue stage, and then it's going to enter the address generation unit. When we update the issue queue with these two memory operations, we add them into the load store queue. So we've got them in program order, and we know their issue queue slots. When the first instruction finishes its address generation, we know what its address is. So its address is 4096. It's ready to go. The load word here is ready to go. And the store word is still waiting uh, the two values from the preceding instructions. So the load word updates the load store queue after, a, after address generation. And since it's the earliest memory operation and it's ready to go, it is going to go into the memory stage on the next cycle as usual. So now the load store queue entry zero is in the M2 actually accessing the data cache. We can release its load store queue slot. We don't need it. We can reuse it with a different one. The add I finishes updates the rename register file one, which means that the store words address part is actually ready to go. It's no longer pending for its base address. Well, we know what $29 is now. That's here. And so that means that we get to dispatch this store word, even though the value that we're going to store is not ready yet. We're going to allow address generation to proceed, even if the value that needs to go to memory is not ready yet. Meanwhile, this load word finished its address generation, and we know what address it's using. It's using address 4092, but we cannot allow it to go into the cache access because there's an earlier instruction in program order whose address we don't know yet. So that's what our load store queue is doing. It's allowing us to start things out of order, but then slow down until we get back in order again to some extent.
So when we finish address generation, then we have the address is ready. In the same cycle, the value that we're going to store to memory becomes available. And we end up plucking that value out of the issue queue. Since we know what issue queue slot to look in, we can check that issue queue for that source value. And so when we get that value, we pull it in there. So now this store is ready to go. And we didn't dispatch this load word out of order because that earlier store was pending. And it turns out that was a good thing because the addresses match. And so that means we know we have to do this store before we do this load because those addresses match. When the addresses don't match, we can actually rearrange these loads and stores um, out of program order again. And sometimes processors will do that. They, they want to prioritize loads and get the loads done sooner because loads are bringing values into registers and presumably are gonna be used and therefore are on um, some kind of dependency path. So the store word is in the load store queue and it picks up the store value over the forwarding lines or the bypass network. So it knows it has to store the value that was in memory at address 4096, whatever that value was, that's what we loaded just now. And uh, it can now proceed. And then after that, we can send the load to memory. Since we know these addresses are the same, we actually know that this load word is just gonna load this value. So we can even forward from stores to loads through the load store queue, right? We know this load is gonna load the same value that this store stores. So we know this load just wants this value right here. So we can pull this value out of the load store queue and pop it up into the issue queue and write it to its destination. So that's store to load forwarding. The store word finishes and we'll do the load store queue to access if we didn't do a store load forward. Most processors will do that store load forwarding as well since it's um, cheaper. So then the pipeline diagram um, with an advanced scoreboard that can predict when values are gonna be ready and a load store queue. So now we've replaced M1 with AG and M2 with the dollar uh, D cash. D dollar sign D cash. Well, let's see what's worth talking about here. The store word fetch decode issue it actually can issue because it knows that the address the dollar 29 is going to be ready in one cycle so it's able to issue a little bit proactively that's the advanced scoreboard being able to say on the next cycle you're going to actually know what dollar 29 is and you'll be able to forward that value into the address generation unit that's what's going on there it's about the extent of it i guess architecturally there is often a separate load queue and a separate store queue. You can you can reorder loads with respect to each other. You just can't reorder stores with respect to each other or stores with respect to loads that they're dependent upon in general. You can't reorder stores with respect to each other because they modify the processor state. And so um, it makes it hard to have control speculation and, and precise exceptions. Another thing is that the, the checking of uh, each load against the stores is actually done with uh, associative search. So kind of like associative cache where you take the tag and you check against all the tags in a set. The loads store queues, you take the address of a load and you check it against the effective addresses of all the stores. And if there's a, a hit or an unresolved store uh, earlier in program memory, then you have to wait. So when all the stores that are earlier in program order have known addresses and none of those addresses match your address, a load can go out of order with respect to those stores, also with respect to other loads. Load store queue has to be large enough to hold the pending memory accesses. Otherwise, you have to stall issuing because you need to allocate load store queues when you finish decode. So that is the load store queue. Um, you know, this is one of those topics that really, it does require multiple or repeated exposure to. So before we totally go bananas here, let's take another quick pause.